السلام عليكم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونؤمن به ونتوكل عليه ونعوذ بالله من شر انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهدي الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له نشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له ونشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله اما بعد and brothers and sisters i am thankful to allah to have the great honor and privilege to be here with you at this wonderful camp um, this camp is as much for me as it is for you. Um, I'm very happy to be here with um, Sheikh Muhammad Noor and my good friend, uh, Professor Abdul Hakim Jackson. Um, and also to see so many of you that I've come to know over the years. I was shocked to see how many people, how many of you I remember. Most of you actually remember you. And so many of the brothers I remember, some of my, some of my good friends, some of my best friends around the world in Canada and the United States. So I want to say that I'm very happy to be here and also to get an opportunity for me to learn, to sit down into the sessions of my brother, um, Brother Sherman, uh, Professor Sherman and, um, and Sheikh Noor, and Brother Pavez, and, and the rest of you. Uh, brothers and sisters, in these two days, um, every one of my talks, I'm going to focus on, on one thing. I'm going to keep that uh, in front of you. Though we speak about each particular topic, but there's one thing that I'm going to keep focusing on, and I'm going to talk in detail about it tomorrow, and that is striving toward excellence. And the first thing that I uh, want to know, um, Brother um, Jackson, I, I noticed something from, the more I studied the Sharia, I noticed something. It seems to me that it is inherent in human beings, at least, to always compare themselves with someone else. It's inherent. Can't help it. I'll go a step further. It seems that this nature to compare is even in other living things. And when Allah asked Iblis, why didn't you bow down when I told you to bow down? He said, I'm, I'm better than him. This comparison, comparison that this jinn, a jinn made, not with another jinn, but this jinn made with a human being. قالوا وتجعلوا فيها ما يفسد فيها ويسفك دماء ونحن نصبه وبحمدك ونقدس لا قال إني أعلم ما لا تعلمون. And when Allah said to the angels, these creatures of light, I'm about to create in the earth a Khalifa. These angels started to compare themselves with the children of Adam. That we, you're going to make that which caused mischief in the earth and the shedding of blood while we, we celebrate your praises. Look how they compare themselves with human beings. Look how the jinn compare themselves with human beings. Aisha radiallahu anha, everyone knows that she was the favorite wife of the prophet. Everybody knows that. When someone asks him the question, who does he love the most? He said, Aisha. Min al-rijal, among men, Abuha. Among men, her father. But yet Aisha, most beloved, and yet Aisha, she said her own words, she was more jealous of who? Who? Khadija. More than any of the wives of the Prophet, even Khadija had died, but yet Aisha couldn't help herself comparing herself. Everyone is always comparing themselves. You can't help it. You know what's happening in Sydney, Australia right now? Olympics. Every four years, people around the world come together to compete. Who's the best? Who's the fastest? Who can play better basketball? Who can play, who can swim the best? This nature of competition, it seems to be within us. How many of you study Arabic? Raise your hand. You know Arabic or you study Arabic? Raise your hand. We have an Arabic professor here. You ought to, I'm telling you, everywhere I go, I'm preaching that every Muslim has to study the Arabic language. You must study the Arabic language. You must study the Arabic language. If you leave this camp 
at least with the desire to learn to study the Arabic language, then you have taken a, a greater step to get closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in my opinion. But there is in Arabic grammar what is called ismu tafdil. Ismu tafdil is the comparative or the superlative. If you say, ana kabirun, I am big. Ana akbaru min akhi, I am bigger than my brother. He is the biggest man in Medina in the city. This is comparative. Now I say, all I have to say what? I don't think that this group here of these 80 participants or so should look at yourself as just simple Muslims. You came to a retreat for two days, alhamdulillah, you're going to get a little bit of knowledge, a little bit of information. And, and stop at that. that and not, not my opinion. I don't know what the Professor Jackson is thinking about. I, I have something else in my, I don't know what Pervez is thinking. I have something else in my mind. Let me share what I have in my mind. I think that every one of you should put in your heart that you want to be the best that you can be. Now, and sisters, don't, 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 don't get angry at me, okay? I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna talk brother language. For just a moment. Sisters, I'm going to teach you a little bit about basketball. Would you mind? We can, we can learn a little lesson from that. And I, I told Pervez already, really, I'm, I got an attitude. So please forgive me, I got an attitude. I, I came with my sneakers. I'm serious. I'm, I'm mad. I'm mad. I'm going to try to find me another camp. You think I'm you, you think kidding, right? You watch. I'm, I'm expecting a basketball court. I bought my sneakers, the brothers are here, I wanted to show them. A brother from Philadelphia is here, I want to show you what happens when New York and Philadelphia get together. <laughs> I want to show you, I want to show you, but you won't let me, because you refuse to have a basketball court. I... Yeah, we can get one of those portables and fix it up, yeah, serious. Now, I want to teach you sisters a little bit about basketball. Brothers, if you know what I'm talking about, raise your hand. How many, I didn't ask you yet, how many brothers know what a, a triple-double is? Raise your hand, a triple-double. How many sisters know what a triple-double is? Oh, you know, okay, all right. A triple-double is in a basketball game where three different times you get a double. For instance, if you score 10 or more points, it's a double. Not nine, not eight, but 10 or more. 10 or more rebounds, 10 or more assists, 10 or more blocks, 10 or more steals. And so, if you study, go back, uh, there's a basketball player named Oscar Robinson, one of the best ever. He knows people, you, you, it's not your generation. But do you know the one year, Oscar Robinson, he averaged a triple-double. Yeah, he's one of the most prolific scorers in the NBA history, Oscar Robinson. Now the reason I'm saying that, brothers and sisters, what I expect from this group is for each one of you to look at yourself and look at different aspects of your life and always make an improvement upon one of them. For instance, my topic today is about the heart. Spiritual. Today is about spiritual things. This whole day is about spiritual things, inshallah. But tomorrow we're talking about mental things. If your strength is in spiritual, but you have a weakness in the mental, in the physical, in the material, then work on that aspect of your deen to help you make, make you be well-rounded. What I expect from this group is a well-rounded group in everything. But the foundation has to be the spiritual. Someone asked the question, how long will, this, will the building stand? The answer is, how strong is the foundation? And what I want to speak about the next few moments is the foundation, and I want to talk about your heart. Because that's the key. Now, Brun says this, and, 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 and I'm, I'm telling you, and don't, go, don't be going to sleep. I'm not playing that today. Just you have to, because this group is, is, what, two and a half days? That means two and a half days, you have to focus and concentrate, even though it's one after the other after the other, but this is going to be one of the greatest moments of your life, inshallah. 1978, I was blessed to go to a training program. Naperville, Illinois, is a little bit longer than this program. It's 40 days. And we studied under Sheikh Jafar Idris, 
Brother Muhammad Kutub. Uh, we call Brother Big Thick. Hussein Hamid. Yeah, he was great. Honestly, his, his mind was, was great. And we lived with them, these teachers. We lived with them for 40 days. And after that, we went to Mecca for four months. And we lived with these same teachers for four months. And brothers and sisters, you cannot imagine the impact it had on my life. It changed my life completely. I'm hoping that this session here, these two and a half days, is going to change your life if you want it to to put you on another level that you never dreamed of, inshallah. But this, these two and a half days is not the ending, but the beginning. Hopefully, the, uh, the speakers are gonna push you in a way, inshallah, that you're gonna take a great big leap, inshallah. Now, you know, brothers and sisters, what's amazing to me? In this country, people spend billions of dollars on security. Almost all of you, when you leave your house, you lock the door. Because you're concerned about your valuables, you don't want it to be stolen. But yet, the same people who are concerned about locking their door and their property, these people let anything attack and destroy their hearts. This country, America, spent billions of dollars surrounding its borders to make sure enemies don't come in. But every day, through the television set, through the internet, through the radio, through magazines, through newspapers, the enemies is coming, destroying this country in a way greater than any other army could do. And that is because the people don't watch over their hearts. Dr. Jackson, a few years ago, I remember I was watching the news, and I saw something very amazing. I saw a, a picture um, in one part of, of Washington, D.C., there was a bird, and every time the, uh, uh, the human beings walked past this tree, the bird would attack it. And they were amazed, and, you know, and, and the bird would come, and it would swoop down, and just annoy the people, and the people would go away. And they watched. And the bird wouldn't bother you until it come near the tree. They found out that in the tree was the youngin' of the bird, and so the bird was protecting its youngin' even to the effect of attacking a human being because it wanted, it wanted to protect its, 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 its new uh, offspring. Now, brothers and sisters, what about your heart? What's the condition of your heart? Uh, there's a dua that the Prophet Muhammad والسلام, always made. And remind me at the end of the talk, I'm going to share this dua with you, this supplication, I think is very, very critical. But let me take a few moments to talk about the heart. What is the heart? If you look at linguistically what the heart is, قلب. قلب. I wish we had a, a board or something you can write on or some easels. Maybe by tomorrow? We have a chance, oh, you do? Uh huh, okay. I'll know for the next one, inshallah. But this word, قلب. It's so important. If you look at the word qalaba in the Arabic dictionary, qalaba means to turn. To turn. To turn over. The qalaba, the fifth form of qalaba, means something that's turned over. And the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, said, it, the heart in the hadith sahih, it is named qalb. The only reason that it's named qalb is because it turns over. It keeps turning over. The nature of the heart is that it doesn't stay the same. It's always ready to receive influences and it changes. And this is why the Prophet والسلام, said, Ya Mukhalib al Qulub, Thabit Kalbi, Ala Dinik. Oh Allah, the turner of hearts, make my heart firm toward your deen, your religion. And we're going to learn this hadith, this, uh, this, this uh, dua, and we're going to say it over and over again, inshallah. Now, brothers and sisters, I'm going to uh, tell you something that happened to me many years ago, and, and it still affects me today. Still affects me today. I was walking down um, Brooklyn, Bethlehem Stuyvesant one day, one of the brothers from the masjid. And all of a sudden, the brother said, Imam Saraj, look, look at that, look at that. And I looked. And I said, Stop for Allah. 
Why you tell me to look? You know what we do sometimes, we play games, we say, Starfullah, look at that. Starfullah, look, look, look at that, Starfullah. Look how she dressed. Because you don't know that when you take a look at that, it affects your heart. One of the things that we're going to talk about today, inshallah, we're going to learn how to protect our hearts because that which attacks our, heart, attack our hearts comes from our eyes, especially, and especially from our ears, our eyes and our ears. What I want to talk about the next few moments is protection of the heart. Now, brothers and sisters, one of the things that we have to learn, students of knowledge, is that every time you read something from Quran or Hadith, Study every word because every word is a hint of something, some wisdom. When you get a chance, I want you to go to volume number four of Al-Bukhari Hadith in the beginning section of Anbiya, the Prophets. Notice this Hadith. The Prophet Muhammad wasalam, said that when I was in my house in Mecca, the roof opened up. Question number one, where was he? In his house, in what city? What opened up? Notice, he wasn't in Medina, he wasn't in New York, he wasn't in Houston, he was in Mecca. What opened up? Not the front door, not the basement, not the window, but the roof. And the angel Jibreel came down. Who came down? An angel, yes, but not just any angel, the angel Jibreel. Where did he come in? He came from the roof. Then he cut open my heart, my chest. What did he cut open, his head? No, his leg, his foot, no. He cut open the chest. And then he washed my heart with water from the well of Zemzem. What kind of water did he use? Zemzem. This Allah has given you a hint now. Something miraculous, something big is about to happen. He came from the roof. Angel Jibreel came to the heart of who? Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Not to anybody, not to any prophet, but to Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Then he washed his heart out, not just with water, not any kind of water. What water? Then he took a tray of gold and had in the gold, the tray, hikmah, wisdom, and iman, faith, and he put. The, the, what, kind of, what kind of tray was it? Was it silver? It was a gold tray. What was in the tray? Not ordinary stuff. It's wisdom and iman, faith. And put that in the prophet's heart and closed his chest. And then he took him by the hand and took him up to Jannah. You know the rest of the hadith, inshallah. What is this to teach you? Go to the Quran and see this revelation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not go to the mind of the Prophet, did not go to the brain of the Prophet. Where did it go? Ala qawbihi. In his heart. So the revelation comes not to the brain, man. We're going to talk about that tomorrow. But the revelation comes to the heart. When a man came to the Prophet, the lay salat wa salam, and said, Ya Rasulullah, the Prophet said, you come to ask about bir? You come to ask about righteousness? What did the prophet say? Consult your? Consult your? Heart. Not your mind, not your brain, but consult your heart. Because birr, righteousness, is that which makes the soul tranquil and the heart at peace. And if moon, Sin makes the heart waver. Now, brothers and sisters, go back to the ayat of the Quran, and you will see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala asks us, do we not look at ourselves? Allah only created the heavens and the earth and all in between it with truth. So that means by nature, Human beings are inclined to truth. That's the nature in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created us. Now, brothers and sisters, be careful. Be careful a few things. 
في قلوبهم مرض فزاد الله بمرضا in their hearts is a disease and Allah has increased the, the, the disease the disease in the heart it is not their eyes that are blind but their hearts within their souls all of these things brothers and sisters I'm laying the foundation that the heart is something very very significant it is something that changes very very uh, fast if we're not careful now inshallah let me try to tie it up together I don't know if you heard about what happened uh, just a couple of days in New York City. I mean, really, a major tragedy. Uh, I think his name is John Taylor. This man who uh, robbed a Wendy uh, restaurant and killed, shot seven people, killed five of them. One of them is in critical condition, the other one in bad condition. Now, when I heard about that, I, I'll be honest with you, I was, I was devastated. I've never been affected so much in my life. When you read the details that what he did, he came in at night, called for the manager, took the manager downstairs, and told the manager to call the other workers downstairs. It's closing time. He took one of them, he took them systematically, one by one, tied their hands behind their backs, put a... Uh, tape on their, on their mouth, and then put a, a, some kind of bag, a plastic bag on their head, and put a, a, 380, a 380 millimeter gun to the back of their head and systematically killed each one, or, or shot each one of them. Two of them were, uh, were living. One of them, he, 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 he woke up, and he was unconscious, he had gotten unconscious, he woke up, he called 911, and he fell out again. Police came and rescued him, and the other person was in critical condition. And I said, my, my, God, what, how in the world can someone do that? And I was so angry, it, well, like, it, beloved, I was angry, I, I don't know about any of you who read it. Like, I'm in the city, and I'm thinking about, man, I'd like to find this person, really. And you know what, brothers and sisters, what scares me? That we're living in a time right now that it seems that every day is getting worse. I think I heard about a young boy who shot a teacher, killed the teacher, just maybe yesterday it was. And the Prophet warned us that it's gonna come a time where the person who commit murder won't know why he committed murder, and the one who's murdered don't know why they murdered. We're coming to a time like that, you know why? Because we live in a time where we have sick hearts, real sick hearts. Now I'm gonna ask you a question, I want you to be honest. It's going to pain me to ask me what I'm going to ask you now. It's, going to, it's very painful. How many of you, including Professor Jackson, know Muslims who used to practice the deen but are no longer practicing? Used to pray, no longer pray. If you know someone like that, raise your hand. If you know one, raise your hand. Pervez, you don't know any? Allahu Akbar. How many know more than one? You know what scares me? What scares me is that could be any one of us. No, not me. I'll be a Muslim the rest of my life. Good. I'm glad you think that. Let's see what the Messenger of Allah said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and we'll see. Brothers and sisters, I'm really concern about us, really. You know why? I've seen over the years workers in Islam, I mean, people used to run camps. There's a famous one now, the brothers used to tell me, used to be one of the most famous young youth workers in America. Now he has some kind of, you know what I'm talking about, uh, had, had some kind of uh, so-called gay Muslims. He used, to be a good, he used to be a good Muslim, he used to be a well-known Muslim. And now he's doing that, he's, he's, he's well, yeah, brother, well, well, known, well known for that. And, and, and there's more, and there's more like that. Now, what's gonna make sure that we stay on this dean is the protection of our heart. Brothers and sisters, let me tell you something. 
I have not been to one country or one state or one city where people don't ask me about music. Everywhere I go, every conference, we have dozens of questions. Well, what about music? And I'm sure you've already asked Professor Jackson. If you haven't, you will. Don't worry, they will. But you know what? Brothers and sisters, I pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that one of the things that can come from this group here is a profound love of the Quran. I was here in Houston a few hours, this right before I went to Australia. And remember, as I mentioned uh, about a young man named Harun who took his shahada. And this young man named Harun was a, um, uh, used to be a rap singer and a poet. And he used to write songs. And he was very good at it. And four years ago, as a young man in his early 20s, someone played a disc of the Quran. And he was so impressed with that Quran, he never heard anything like that. He became a Muslim on the spot. This is true. I met him in uh, Jersey City recently. He became a Muslim, didn't know one word of Arabic, but yet he was touched by the Quran, and it had a miraculous effect upon him. And it reminded me the first time I heard the Quran, I even have the tape, where I said, this is the most beautiful thing I ever heard in my life. I have to learn that. That was in 1978, Sheikh Jaffa the Dries recited the Quran for us. And sitting there in that room, I listened to that Quran and was moved by it, not knowing any Arabic. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala lets us know in the Quran that in the remembrance of Allah, the heart feels tranquil. I want you to go, sisters and brothers, to any song you ever heard in your life, the best song that you ever heard in your life. You will notice that that song, is, if it's popular, will be on the charts, like number one for weeks. But notice, it never stays there, does it? If they're lucky, three weeks, four weeks, five weeks, but then after that, the people, they get tired of it. We heard it already. We don't want to hear it again. This is the, the nature of the songs of this world. And it may make you feel good at the moment, but if you heard it over and over again, you get tired and you don't want to listen to it. But yet the Quran, you can hear the Quran all your life, and you would never, ever, ever get tired of hearing the Quran when it's recited in the right way. Now I finish with this. The Prophet said, I swear by Allah, which there's no God other than Him. This is what I want to leave you with, inshallah. It may be that one of you spend the entire life, and definitely you the people of gender, no question about it. There's a man, 90 years old. He spent his whole life praying five times a day, went to Mecca, Hajj, he uh, made salat, uh, fasting, every, every day, all of the pillars of Islam. He made, he got up in the middle of the night, he read the Quran all the time. 90 years old, Ahli Jannah. And then something happens and he began to do the work of the people of the hellfire. What would be the work of the people of the hellfire? This man would be so close to the, hell, to the Jannah that the prophet called it the Ra'in. The Ra'in, maybe like a, fore, a forearm. That means he's just, he's just there. He's right there. Now, let me stop for a moment. Is, are any of you confident in this room right now that you are there? Any of you that confident right now that you are there, that you're right there in Jannah? Are any of you that confident? Here's a man who, according to the Hadith, is of Ahli Jannah, for sure. He's that close. But then he began to do something other than that. He does the work of the people of the hellfire, and he enters the hellfire. 
Now, brothers and sisters, you know what that should make you feel like? Wait a minute, man. I can't ever get so proud or arrogant to think that I got it made. I don't care how much I know, but there's a chance that if I don't get myself together, my program together, that even though I spend my whole life in the deen, I could end in a wrong way. And the Prophet said, in the bi khawatim, your deed shall be judged by your latest deeds. Now, what deed could you do? The deed that can be done, brothers and sisters, in that late stage. Murtad. Leave the deen. Leave Islam. Go into shirk. And if you die in shirk, what happens? Hellfire. Now, what does all this have to do with the heart? Brothers and sisters, I want to help you, help myself. Every one of you, la mahalla, la mahalla, said the Prophet said, it's inevitable, will commit adultery. Say it again. Lamahallata, he said, every, the son of Adam, every one of you must have some part of the commission of adultery. And then he said, the adultery of the eyes is the look. Now, brothers and now sisters. I'm going to talk straight to the brothers now. Now, brother, let's be for real. Okay, I did some of that stuff now. Let's be for real. Okay? I did that, right? Now, let's, let's be straight. How many, of you on, how many of you are on the campus? Go to college. Raise your hand. Let me tell you what's happening to you right now, brothers, and tell me if I'm, I'm off. This time of the year, the heat of the summer, is the worst time for a good Muslim man. Uh, Dr. Jackson, let me tell you something, Akhi. Honestly, honest to Allah, Akhi, I try, I try to turn my head. I do. I work on it. I'm serious. I, I, I'm, so, I, I'm serious. I, I couldn't believe it. The airport, I can't believe it. Every time you see a woman, you turn. I'm not going to look. Another one there. I'm not going to look. Another one there. Am I right, brothers? Everywhere is surrounding because they take off their clothing and you are a man. You are a man. Now, this is like a workshop now. It's not like, oh, brother, alhamdulillah, brother, I never look, alhamdulillah. <laughs> I look up in the sky all the time. I don't think so, Akhi. I don't think so. And I'm telling you, I don't, I hate it. I hate it. I hate it when women take off their clothing and they're naked. I really do, brother. I hate it. I hate it. There, there are times, Allah is my witness, Akhi, will lie. Even right now, there are times I don't even, I get, I hate turning on TV. Sometimes I, something special, I want to watch some news, I heard about it. You know, I turn, but reluctantly, Akhi, even, I, this whole week, I didn't turn it on one. I just I hate it. Allahi Azim, I hate it. Because there's so much evil on it. So much evil on it. And brother, I'm telling you, if you keep looking, when will you stop looking? When? When will you lower your gaze? Lower your gaze and guard your modesty. When will you do it? You see, it's easy here. All the Muslims together, you know, and everybody is good, you know, everybody reminding each other. But when you're alone by yourself, driving in your car, that's the test, brother. That's the test. When you're home in your apartment by yourself and you got the TV on, that's the test. That's the test. That's the real test. It's not, it's not trying to impress anybody here. I'm trying to get it so that when you leave here by yourself, you're going to be straight and you're not going to look. 
يا نساء النبي لست لك أحد من النساء all wives of the prophet you're not like the other women إن تكيتون if you fear Allah فلا تخدعنا بقولي so don't make your voice so sweet in my brother beloved honestly أخي last night I was at a program they shocked me أخي it was a Muslim program and they meant they meant well they really meant well أخي they had little children reciting the Quran. It was nice. They had speakers. It was nice. They meant well. Muslims, man. But then they, they, then they put this sister, man. They put this sister in front of the brothers to recite the Quran. No, no, was, but Akhi, it was nice, but it was too nice. No, I'm, I'm serious. You can't make your voice like that in front of men. Why? Because Allah said, because he who got a disease in his heart is going to be swerved by it. You may, your intention is right. Your intention is honorable. You, can, you have to be careful. That I'm saying the voice. Can women speak in front of men? Yes. Don't misunderstand. Can women speak to men? Yes. But how must she speak? How must she speak to men? First, what she talk about, ma'roof. Only what is right, what is just, what is fair. What Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would have you talk about, not talking about the other things that's displeasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now what happens, akhi, we are sick. A lot of us are sick. And there's a lot of diseased people walking around calling themselves Muslims and then she may mean well. But because there's a sickness and the disease in the heart, then he's affected by it. He's moved by those sweet words. So therefore, you gotta be very careful. How many times, man, did you pick up the telephone, put it on hold, somebody put you on hold, and in the background, singing and music and you know what you don't think that this affecting you do an experiment sing a popular song to somebody in the morning before the night's over they'll start singing it that's the way it is these beats these musical beats have an effect on you they have effect on your heart and if you don't be careful it's going to affect your heart and brothers and sisters this is what I'm saying to you if you want to guard yourself and save yourself and save your dean, the way you save your dean is to save the best part of you. And the best part of you is your heart. You know what scares me? Study the Quran, Bani Israel, children of Israel. Know what happened to them? Qasat. Is it Qasat? Jackson? Qasat? Mean hardened? The hearts became hardened. You know what happens when that happens? That no matter what you say, there's no effect. Because the heart is so blind now, it's so dead, it can't be awoken. Because it's diseased. I close with this and ask myself the question, what is the cure for this diseased heart? I was in Massachusetts in a school they sent me a, a note, Imam Siraj, the policy or the um, philosophy of this school is that we would rather build a fence on the top of the hill than have an ambulance on the bottom. The prevention. But what about the cure? Allah, the Prophet Muhammad wasalam, said, Allah da'a illa anzalahu shafa'a. Allah has never sent a sickness or a disease without sending the cure. And there's a cure for the diseased heart. And let me tell you what that cure is. Very, very simple. It's the remembrance of Allah. Aisha radiallahu anhu said, Kana Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam yafkurullah ala kuli ahyani. The Prophet alayhi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam remembered Allah in every occasion. Guess what? If you come to this camp for two days, inshallah, being around these Muslims, listening to these speakers, 
definitely will have a heart, uh, an effect on your heart, for sure. Because the, remi the remembrance will definitely purify you or do something to your heart. But the danger is, when you walk away from this camp, and you go back to business as usual, and you go back to the same things that you used to do before you came here, then all that good that you got from the camp would go away. I expect from this group to be the best. The best individually, you ask yourselves the question, what, how can I improve myself from this camp? Look and focus on some area that you want to improve upon. And I'm telling you, brothers and sisters, what will help you? Learning to read Al-Quran will definitely help you because the medicine is the Quran. I didn't say translation of the Quran. I said Quran. And believe me, it'll have a profound effect on you, inshallah. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. We have how many minutes for questions and answers? About 10 minutes? Okay, brothers and sisters, it's your floor. You can ask or protest or whatever. Yes, ma'am. This is one of the, yeah, one of the classic questions. What happens when you have a friend like that? Stop praying. What do you do to them? My recommendation, sister, is this. Try everything you can to bring them back. You know what I found out from playing basketball? If you study coaches, coaches, a good coach, doesn't respond to all his players the same way. If you take Larry Bird, for instance, there's one guy named that's a, a rookie, I think, a second year man. Huh? No, not best, the other one. The... Yeah, crochet, right? Yeah. People will tell you that he gets on him, he whips him, but he, he respects him. He respects his game, but he does that to bring the best out of him. But there's some people you can't do that to. Some people are so sensitive that when you criticize them, they go in the shell. You have to find out from your friend what works better with them. Sometimes, direct approach. Say, listen, you better get yourself together, sister. You're going on the wrong path. I'm afraid that if you continue to go that way, you're going to lose your, you're going to lose your life if that works with her. If it doesn't work with her, you can try several things. You can try getting a tape, sending her this tape. Say, listen, I, I, I attended a conference and I want you to listen to this tape and tell me what you think about it. See, this way there's no argument there. Sometimes when you approach a person directly, you argue. But if you write a letter, send the tape, send a book, and hope that they read it, maybe something in it will touch them. Sister, there's no guarantee. There's nothing that I can give you or Muhammad Noor can give you. Sheikh Muhammad Noor or Brother Jackson give you and say, this is the formula. Do this, they're going to come back. You, you can't get it. The point that we're trying to say is that who was a better da'i than Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him? Who was better than him? Right? Yet he couldn't get his uncle, Abu Talib, to take shahada. Couldn't get him. So it doesn't mean that, you, you know, doesn't mean that the person is going to come accept Islam. Who's a better da'i than Prophet Noah, alayhi salatu wasalam? Yet his son, he couldn't get his son to follow him. So sisters, I'm saying, you, you, you feel it, you try to do everything you can, Invite them, do every way you can, nice, be strong, be sweet, be kind, whatever it takes, you try different things, inshallah, I hope that it works. Yes, brother. Islamic music is fine. Yeah, but what is Islamic music? That's the, that's the, yeah, Islamic music, see if you say Islamic music, brother and sister, I'm not, I never said music was haram, it's not, that's not, that wasn't my point. Because there's a, lot of, there's a lot of music that's halal, and there's a lot of music that's haram. Absolutely. Now the wisdom is to try to find out the both, and I'm sure Professor Jackson is going to tell you before he leaves here, inshallah. <laughs> yes, my brother. But let me tell you something, brother and sister. Let me tell you something. I, you know, I, I think about, I think, uh, the Akeem, I think about, like him in some, in some respect. Let me tell you what happened. How many of you heard a, a group called Tribe Called Quest, a Q-tip? Right? Now Q-tip... 
you gonna say temptations or something? Q-tip, um, uh, uh, what's his name? He's, what's his Kamal. Kamal is his Muslim. He used to come to Masjid Taqwa a lot for Juma. You know, he came to me once and said, Imam Siraj, you know, we got some, um, some words from one of your khutbahs. We want to put it on our album. Can, can, can we do it? I said, yeah, no problem. And I was shocked, man. I went to, I went to, to Chicago. At least 100 Muslims came to me. Imam Siraj, Imam, I heard you, I heard you. And I never heard it before, right? And, and I, was, I was hearing it for months. Imam, I heard you on, on his album, right? So our words was on his album. And then I went to Utah and gave a lecture at one of the universities in Utah. I think it was a, a, a Thursday night. A woman came to me and said, Imam Sarraj, last Wednesday I took Shahada. I said, oh man, that's great. Who gave you Shahada? Q-tip. He came a week before, gave a concert. But in the concert, he spoke to her in the end and gave a Shahada. Sometimes you can be in something that's not idealistically the best, even pretty bad, but some good can come out of it. So there are some brothers in that world, I try to encourage them, brothers, that's not the best. The music industry is very, very corrupt. And you have to have a very strong heart to be in that industry and not be affected. You have to be very strong, surrounded by drugs, surrounded by women, surrounded by men, a lots of money, opulence, and all of these things. So you have to have a very, 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 very extremely strong heart. So my recommendation to the brothers, don't get into that industry. But if you're gonna sing Islamic songs, that's good. I'm telling you, I'm of the opinion that Muslims need culture. We need good, wholesome culture. And our scholars have to show us the difference of what's halal and what's haram. Yusuf Islam, remember him, Cat Stevens? A few years ago, I had a talk with him. You don't know this, beloved. I had a talk with him. And he was giving up his singing. I said, I don't think you should give up your singing, brother. I think you should sing for Allah. You, Allah bless you with a beautiful voice. I think you should use that voice, but in a good way, in an encouraging way, he's done it. In fact, if you look at him now, man, he's, he's got several discs out there. Very, very good. My children have some of his songs, the alphabet song. Almost all the children I know, they have this alphabet song. A is for Allah, the universe. You know, obviously, right? <laughs> so I'm saying uh, our wisdom is trying to find, help us find the transition from those things that are absolutely haram, how to make the transition. And this is where I think the scholars have to come today. Not just, no, 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 you can't do it. No, 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 but to help them make the transition so that they can come and do what's halal. Because we need, in my opinion, we need some halal entertainment. That's why when you said it's, it's Islamic music, it's, it's, Islamic music is halal. But some people think that what they're doing Islamic music, it may not be. I, I, was, I was reading a magazine just the other day, you know, and um, they said, you know, halal entertainment. But it wasn't halal entertainment. It don't become halal because you say it's halal. It becomes halal by the rules of Sharia. One more, inshallah. Yes, brother. When is what? Masjid Taqwa? When is it going to be built? When you give me a two million dollar check. Actually, brothers and sisters, we still about five, it's, this, the project costs about six million dollars. We have in good commitments, 1.5 million dollars only. And it's a lot of money. I'm hoping, I was hoping that within a, a year and a half that we make groundbreaking um, ceremony, inshallah. I'm still gonna try it, I'm still gonna try my best. You see what happens, we have these big events, you think people are gonna come in and bring all this money, it doesn't happen. So um, make dua for us that are hopefully a year and a half you'll be able to, to, to break the, the ground, inshallah. Sure.